Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. On March 22nd, 1989, longtime great commissioner Pete Rizal announced his retirement was in the near future. This day was also significant because it was the day that this week's topic was born. His name? J.J. Watt. Now normally we don't talk about players still in the game on this show, but in recent weeks his number 99 jersey has been considered, air quotes, big news. And this helped resurface a forgotten legend of the gridiron, a man named Marshall Goldberg. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. Great Scott. This time when we step up the DeLorean, the date is March 2nd, 2021, and we land in the middle of Arizona desert. Now, we didn't go back too far this time. Maybe only had a few bananas to toss into that Mr. Fusion this time. But we did land on a great story. We just heard J.J. Watt, yes, yeah, superstar defensive player for the Houston Texans, is joining his buddy Nuke Hopkins over in a Cardinals jersey. Wait a second. Why is that significant to a football history podcast? Well, this is where the history perspective comes in, because I'm reading an article stating J.J. Watt, again in air quotes, wearing 99 after receiving permission from Marshall Goldberg's daughter. <laughs> Wait a second. What does that have to do with anything? Let's go ahead and beep, bop, boop. Let's go to the Google machine and let's see what's going on. Who the heck is Marshall Goldberg? Wait a tick. As I'm reading it, this guy seems to be a superstar. He's a long forgotten hero of the gridiron. Why have I not heard of this guy? And his jersey was retired by the Chicago Cardinals? What? I gotta check this out. So, as you might be guessing, (laughs) this conversation is heading somewhere. It's time to get the preeminent source for Cardinal history. Some have compared him to legendary historians of old. He's been compared to Herodotus, Tacitus, and Plutarch. Or even a wordsmith like Shakespeare, Hemingway, or Mark Twain. He's the one, the only, Joe Ziemba! He's the number one guest on the Football History Dude podcast, and I brought him back for an impromptu interview to discuss the life of Marshall Goldberg and a little about jersey retirements in the NFL. Now we're going to dive into our discussion, but first, I want to tell you about the Sports History Network. We are creating the headquarters of sports yesteryear, and we want you on our team. If you would be interested in starting your own podcast, writing a blog article, or anything else revolving around the history of your favorite sport... Reach out to us on the contact page over at sportshistorynetwork.com. You can also read the article about the life of Marshall Goldberg by Joe Ziemba at sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash M Goldberg. But for now, let's get into the interview with Joe Ziemba. I was on NFL.com the other day and I happened to see this article about J.J. Watt and I was like, why did I? I had to bring Joe Ziemba on because it had something to do with the Cardinals. I wanted to ask him. Why did I read an article about how J.J. Watt had to get permission to wear 99 when he's always been 99 in my eyes when he plays for the Cardinals this season? Joe, can you help me answer this question? Well, thank you, Arnie. It's a great question. And who would think 70-some years after Marshall Goldberg played his last game for the Cardinals that his name would literally be in the headlines again? Well, the reason is uh, J.J. Watt wanted to wear number 99. 
And back in about 1951, the Chicago Cardinals retired the number of Marshall Goldberg. He was one of the first two Cardinals. There's only five in their long hundred and some year history that have had their number retired. He and Stan Malden, who was a tackle who unfortunately passed away in the locker room after the first game of the 1948 season. So those were the first two to have their number retired. And of course, it's a great honor for a player to have your number retired. No one else can ever wear it again. And so we look back now 70 some years later, it is 70 years since that number was retired when someone else would, would like to wear it. And, and generally it's Kind of one of those unwritten but written understandings that you don't wear a number that's retired. So I think that's why this became both controversial as well as enlightening because J.J. Watt wasn't really going to push it, but he had the, I guess I'd, I'd say the dignity and the class to ask the family of Marshall Goldberg if he could wear that number. And of course, they readily gave him permission, which I thought was great. So on one hand, you have some that say, well, a number's retired. Should it ever be worn again? We've had a couple of instances in the last uh, couple of decades, I guess. One was when Peyton Manning went to Denver, and he wore a number that had been retired. And I think when Jerry Rice went to Seattle, he wore Steve Largent's retired number. I, I can't think of any other examples. I'm sure there's others, but about 139 numbers have been retired by teams in the NFL. And so the Cardinals only have those five. And J.J. Watt uh, suddenly has now become linked forever with Marshall Goldberg, one of the true legends in the legacy and the history of the NFL's oldest team. You know, you mentioned Marshall Goldberg, and the and I, when I read this article, the only thing I could think of is Goldberg from the WWE, WWF, and he was a, a div, you know he was a lineman actually playing in college sports. I can't remember. I think he made it to the NFL too, but I'm going to have to go back and check on that and a knee injury or something like that. So it's not that Goldberg, right? Because you said a long time ago. So who was Marshall Goldberg? Marshall Goldberg, if we went back to the 1930s, let's say 1937, he was probably the most famous football player in the country. He was a two-time All-American at Pittsburgh in college. They won the national championship in 1937. And he was All-American and a halfback uh, during that season, finished third in the Heisman Trophy voting. But he's the kind of individual that always put the team ahead of himself. So here he was as an All-American halfback. His coach, Jock Sutherland, asked for his senior year that Goldberg move to fullback. They they needed him there. So that's a, quite a different position. You're doing a lot more blocking, more in the interior of the line. So what did Goldberg do? He became an All-American that year as a fullback. And one of the early press releases, which I really enjoyed, I think it came from the Chicago Tribune when Goldberg was drafted by the Cardinals then in 1939, said, last year, Goldberg was named an All-American as a fullback. The year before, he was named All-American as a halfback. In our opinion, if Goldberg played tackle, he'd be named an All-American. So it was quite a tribute to him, but also, again, showed that his unselfish nature, that he was ready to put the team first and help them win some more games, uh, playing a different position that he had really not played before. You know, I, I find it interesting that you said he was one of the biggest names or maybe the biggest name at the time. And I, even though I've been doing this podcast for coming up on three years and about a month, I had never even heard of that name, Marshall Goldberg, or if I did, it was in passing. It kind of reminds me of Warren Rogan has a podcast on the network, Sports Forgotten Heroes. And this seems like a perfect topic or a perfect episode for him. Just a name that we had never heard or that nowadays we don't really hear about. And here you are again telling me that he's one of the biggest names at the time. Um, what year did you say he got drafted to the Cardinals? He was drafted in 1939. He was the 12th overall pick. The draft actually took place in December of 1938. So he was the second choice of the Cardinals. A lineman named Key Aldrich uh, was the first pick overall of the draft, and uh, Goldberg was the 12th pick. So he signed with the Cardinals shortly thereafter. During his uh, the summer before his rookie season, he injured his ankle, so he was slowed up by injury uh, pretty much that initial season with the Cardinals. Their coach, ironically, was one of the Cardinal big names from the past, Ernie Nevers. And he was the head coach, and the team was horrible. But I shouldn't say that about my beloved Cardinals, but they were. But Goldberg stuck with it. 
He came into his own in the early 40s when Jimmy Councilman became the coach. And every player that you would hear about or well, not too many around, I guess, anymore that would talk about Jimmy Councilman said that he could both inspire you and uh, charm you and get you to do your best on the field. And he certainly did that for Goldberg. I think it was during the 1941 or 42 season that he, at one time during that season, led the NFL in five different categories. And he ended up uh, being the leader in interceptions on defense. He was the leader in kick returns as well as the leading rusher for the Cardinals. So he would lead the league in a couple of categories and lead the team in several. So that's some of the talent that was really established with, with Marshall Goldberg early in his career. And as you and I know, and hearing all of the wonderful shows you've had over the last months, football was different back in the 1930s. These guys went both ways in the pro leagues. They had part-time jobs. Uh, they had to work during the season. Sometimes the team would accommodate the players so they could work their jobs and still get to practice. And and yet here we are with uh, limited passing, uh, players going both ways, and Goldberg established himself not only as an offensive threat, as I mentioned, but I would consider him as the first defensive specialist in the NFL. And his coach, Jimmy Councilman, was one who really supported that theory by talking about how Goldberg had this vision that he would study the opposing receivers. If they were leaning forward, well, maybe they're going to go out for a short pass. If they're leaning back, they're getting ready to take off on a long bomb. If their hands are held a certain way at the side, well, they're not planning on catching a pass. Maybe they're just there to do a block. And so Goldberg would look at that. He would memorize plays of the opposition. And he had, uh, if we kept sacks in those days, even though he played safety, he might have had uh, near the league's, league leading sacks as well uh, from his defensive position just because of the way he played defense. And it wasn't until the last year of his career, which was 1948, that he, he played strictly defense. So from 39 through 47, Marshall Goldberg played both ways. He did break his leg in 43 in the preseason, so he missed that, and then spent two years in the service in the Pacific uh, within the Navy in 44 and 45. Yeah, I was going to mention, I mean, so if he was drafted in 38, that would have been, I think, only two or three years after the draft was even started, because wasn't it 36, the first draft of the NFL or something? Yeah, I believe it. Oh, I don't know exact year. I should know that. Uh, Jay Burwanger from Chicago, University of Chicago was the first pick. Right. So, yeah, at, uh, in December of 38, yeah, it was probably one of the first of uh, the second or third drafts. And the, I shouldn't know that. I apologize. <laughs> That's right. I, I'm. I want to say it was 36. I, for some reason, that year pops in my head. Um, you know, <laughs> Burt Bell and not having too much success. You know, over there with the Eagles and such, and then, uh, like you said, with the University of Chicago, Bearwinger never even playing. Just all that craziness of how things were. Like nowadays, you think of I'm number one overall draft pick, and now it's guaranteed millions of dollars. And typically, it's a quarterback or offensive tackle, or maybe, you know, another position, but. It's just like you said, t just way different time. And it's just something that easy going back to, like we said at the beginning, I never even heard of this name. And nowadays it's, you know, they're always out there. Um, you mentioned the service, a different type of draft. I mean, when did he go in? How You said it was 44, 45 ish. Yeah. Two years he went, went in the Navy. He was an ensign. And like all the guys of that generation, they just drop whatever they're doing to, to go into the service. So uh, pretty amazing, too, that with the broken leg, he lost three years then. Came back in 46, stronger than ever. So he, he did not get drafted. He elected. He 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 enlisted himself? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and like you said, a lot of people, the greatest generation, we'll call it. Well, wait. Technically, the greatest generation was the ones that went into the war, right? Not And then the, the after that was the baby boomers. Yes, correct. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's just, just a whole different world. I mean, going back then, you call it you after he comes back, he, he plays for the Cardinals again, but then he was no more. F so you said he was maybe better at defense, but there was some kind of offense that he was a part of. And the, the dream backfield was he actually part of this dream backfield or was he a, a side guy? Yeah. And when you think of the war effort and what it did to the NFL, of course, we have talked before. Uh, on this network about how the Cardinals and the Steelers got together in 1944, the card pits, the infamous winless card pits. And so it was tough times for the Cardinals, but their owner, Charles Bidwell, 
he had managed to keep the talent flow going, signing guys, drafting guys. And when everyone came back, all of a sudden this woeful team that was going winless over 29 straight games there in the earlier 40s was 6-5 and five or so in 1946. But it was setting up the dream backfield that you just mentioned, and Goldberg was part of that. And it was called the dream backfield because it was the first time that we had four All-American college players in the same professional backfield. Paul Christman from Missouri was at quarterback. Pat Harder from Wisconsin was at fullback. And then we had Goldberg from Pittsburgh and the great Charlie Trippi uh, from Georgia, who was the uh, big bonus baby at the start of that season. And, and Trippi was the last piece of that puzzle where they had these four just extremely talented backfield people. And Goldberg then throughout the season and into 1948, he switched more to defense and Elmer Engsman from Notre Dame uh, joined it. So it was still considered part of the dream backfield. But Goldberg, yeah, was a major part of that. He was the uh, elder statesman by that part. Of course, all the players were a little older. Most of them had been in the service. But that really opened the door for the Cardinals to go from an also ran to the top of the league in 1947 when they won the championship. In 48, then, they had an even better team, in my opinion, finishing 11-1, but lost the NFL championship to the Eagles in a crazy snowstorm in Philadelphia, 7 to nothing, thanks to a, an errant fumble late in the game that the Eagles were able to convert. But Goldberg yet was part of that. In fact, in the 1947 championship game, the Cardinals won 28-21, to but the Eagles were threatening and uh, Goldberg intercepted a pass uh, near the end of the game to solidify the victory for the Cardinals. And as we know, it's the last time the Cardinals have won a championship, making it the longest drought of any professional team in terms of years between championships. Right, yeah. I mean, you and I both have had a long, long life of not having any championships around for quite some time. <laughs> I never have my, as far as the Lions go. But uh I mean, I guess you never have either because I would, I'm not trying to age you by any means, but I don't think that you're, you're around at that point either, were you? Uh, and now we have the Bears who uh, are about due again. Right. Now, speaking of the, okay, so the war. And now, how many of the players for the Chicago Cardinals were there before the war started, through the war, and then after? Was it, for the most part, some continuity in the team or was it totally ravished and mostly new players? There was a, a little bit of both. There were players like Goldberg and Chet Bulger, uh, a lineman who, who played on both ends of it. But a lot of the draft choices were coming around. Charlie Trippi was new, of course. Paul Christman had played before the war as well. So it was a combination. So it was a, a very veteran team that came back after the war. And they were able to, of course, with that significant talent in the backfield and a nice strong line and some excellent receivers and with some younger folks uh, that were uh, put into the lineup as well. They were a uh, very potent offense when they got back. Yeah, because I was wondering when I you know, first started looking into this, what the war did to professional sports, not specifically just this one, but all of professional sports and what teams that maybe received some of their veterans that were already there with the team, how much of an advantage it gave to those teams that actually had more continuity versus some of the other teams that had to struggle and almost almost like an expansion team, some of the ones that had lost a lot of their veterans and that kind of thing. Yeah, and, and there were, everybody was hit hard by the war. That's why the NFL was a little shaky during that time with we had the Steagles before we had the card pits and the Cardinals and the Bears tried to merge together, but the league thought it would be too powerful a team. So that was prohibited. But I think, uh, yeah, if you had some of your folks that came back who had been in war, maybe the thought of running wind sprints didn't affect them at all. They'd seen a lot worse than that. And so maybe they took this opportunity to grab a little bit of their youth while they could and uh, continue on playing. But certainly added the toughness to the team as well as the experience. If you had someone who had played earlier before the war and served their two years or three years and come back, uh, like I said, they're, they're probably just anxious to get back on the field again. Others never decided to play again. They've gotten into business, had their families going, but 
It, it would be a great study someday, maybe it's already been done, to see how the war actually did affect a lot of the football and baseball teams with uh, returning veterans and new players coming in. Yeah, I'll have to find someone that wants to perform that study <laughs> if it's not already out there. Because I am. I'm generally curious because there's so many other factors than just, you know, people on the field that are the X's and O's. There's all the other type of – I mean, look at the Lions. I mean, they've had talented teams. I always go to the Lions, but they've had talented teams. But there's always the non-factors that have caused them to have problems. I mean, they had – of course, in my opinion, the greatest running back of all time, and they just could never find a way to do anything with him. Then they had the Megatron, one of the greatest receivers of all time. And, and uh, of course, that's just one player on a team of 11 on the field at a time. But still, it's more than just that as a factor that causes teams to have problems. Look at the Patriots. What's his motto? Uh, do your job, I think, or something like that. Do do the right thing. Or do your job. Do your part. And they have that that mantra, and they everybody does their job. And look at the success for so long. Of course, maybe the whole Brady is kind of you know leaving is maybe proven that they needed a little bit more than just doing. Your, I, I don't know what way. I don't know what side of the fence I am on that one. I was always a. Uh, uh, I, I got annoyed with the Patriots and Brady winning all the time, but then it's like, how do you not respect what they've done in, in this history of? It would have been different back in the day, I suppose, when there wasn't free agency and so much movement along the league, but just got to hand it to them what they've done. And um, getting back to the Cardinals, though, Marshall Goldberg, when did he retire? He retired in May of 1949, and the Cardinals really wanted to to keep him. But as I mentioned, these guys were always working part-time jobs, and he had started out in sales uh, for a manufacturing company. And he eventually purchased the company. And as a businessman, he was uh, pretty darn remarkable as well. He was uh, one of those visionaries who could see that there was possibilities of of trading with both Asia and Europe uh, after the war. And he pounced on that idea. He moved some companies around, did some mergers, and was quite, quite successful as a business person. But I bet you don't know that in 1951, He also was part of a group trying to buy the Cardinals. And you wonder what would have happened if a smart, intellectual, athletic guy like Marshall Goldberg was uh, running that team. Would they still be in Chicago? And like you kind of feel bad about the Lions, and I feel a little bad about the Chicago Cardinals. And you always wonder, what if, what if? So uh, that might have been something to to think about if Goldberg had been successful doing that. So what you're saying is maybe – Instead of the DeLorean question I might ask you at the end, you might use your DeLorean to go back and change it to see what happens. (laughs) Oh, that would be a great one. Yes, exactly. (laughs) So then I was, I would wonder if at that point, does he, because of his acumen, does he take over and the Cardinals become the powerhouse throughout the time and do the Bears end up leaving? Because Hallis just decides, ah, I'm done with this. I don't think he would have ever done that. We would, George Hallis Way is not there at Pro Football Hall of Fame and everything changes and, you know? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> or they could fight it out, and then maybe the, that gives the chance for the Lions to have a little bit more prominence nowadays. But you mentioned Ernie Nevers was his coach, a Hall of Famer, yeah. right? He's a Pro Football Hall of Fame, College right. Football Hall of Fame too, and all that stuff. But you didn't say his number was the one that was retired. It was what was the other guy's name? The tackle, uh, Stan Maldwin. So we have this guy, and we have. Marshall Goldberg, and they're the first two jerseys you're saying that were retired by the Correct, Cardinals. Yes. Why them? You know, that's also an interesting question when you think of people like Patty Driscoll and Ernie Nevers that played for the Cardinals before. Uh, the three of the five, unfortunately, three of the five retired jerseys for the Cardinals ensued after tra- tragic circumstances. Uh, Stan Malden and J.V. Kane uh, both passed away during team activities. And, of course, Pat Tillman we know about. Uh, he's the fifth jersey. So uh, Goldberg was one, and Larry Wilson was the other. Larry Wilson was the third uh, Cardinal jersey retired when he retired when the team was in St. Louis uh, about 20 years later. And so uh, those were, were the ones. But uh, – when, when you think back of, of those guys and who could have been, you wonder. But I think in, in Goldberg's case, 
he was a special person, not only a tremendous athlete, but a caring individual. Even during his Cardinal days, he was very active in raising money for charities, being involved in charitable events, being very kind. He was known as a coach on the field. I've seen references to him in other articles from players that said they had come on the team and he would take extra time to show them some of the secrets on defense, like how to read the quarterback, how to read what that receiver is doing with his hands or his feet. And it just seemed like he was one that I know uh, when he was signed by uh, Charles Bidwell, that he was kind of a favorite, I think. Goldberg admitted that uh, years later, said that they got along pretty well. And, and I think Bidwell was gone by the time the jersey was retired. He had passed away in early 47. But I think that combination of uh, athleticism and his Goldberg as a person is what put him to the top when they thought of honoring him by retiring his jersey. So Bidwell passed away like right before they had that final championship? Yeah, he had put the team together, and that was kind of his dream, and he died rather suddenly in the spring of 1947, unfortunately. What's up with Chicago owners and passing away right before their team? Because that happened nearly about the same thing to Hallis as well. That's right. Hallis, I think, uh, left us in 83, and then the 85 team, of course, is known forever. Right, yeah, and then that was their last championship ring as well, so Mm -hmm. it's... Oh man, I, I don't want to say anything about that in owner's passing because you never want to have that happen. But <laughs> right. Yes. So he Hall of Fame, you, you kind of alluded to some kind of teaser bomb about something that you and I are the only things that the only two people that are gonna know about the way that his retirement jersey or something like that. What what was that little Yeah, you know, when we, we talked at the start tonight, today, uh about JJ Watt. Uh, requesting to use uniform number 99. And right after Marshall Goldberg retired, one of his teammates, uh, Bruce Bomber, uh, wore it in 1949 and 50. And after that, it was retired. But over the years, and the Cardinals, of course, left Chicago in March of 1960, went to St. Louis, and then ultimately to Arizona. And there were two players that played for Arizona, both fairly big names that requested number 99 and, and they were turned down. In fact, one was Dexter Manley, kind of a bad boy. And we've we've heard about him before. Uh, The other one, the guy's name was, I think Aaron Swan, who played in 1990, uh, 91. He played about 10 years with the Cardinals, but neither of them had heard of uh, Marshall Goldberg 30 years later and asked if they could use the jersey, and they were both told the note that was uh, worn by Marshall Goldberg and retired. So that was kind of a little bit of a sidebar to our story with J.J. Watt, that he was kind of fortunate. But at that time, the team was the one, it looks like, who made the the decision to uh, not allow the players to wear Goldberg's jersey. And now, of course, uh, Goldberg's family got involved with it. Well, you said the first guy was kind of – you know, naughty, bad boy, whatever you want to call him. But, you know, you the way you described Marshall Goldberg is how uh, current fans, they view J.J. Watt, you know, a guy who's always charity. Yes. He's Walter Payton Man of the Year type of thing. You know, it sounds like Marshall Goldberg would have won that award, too, for his his team or he would have been nominated at least. So I have no idea about the other guy. But, I mean, J.J. Watt, as far as Marshall Goldberg – the type of personality. It sounds like they're fairly similar kind of guys. Yeah. And now that you bring this up, when you think of Watts actions during the hurricane and the type of stuff he does, not looking for attention, Goldberg was the same way. And so I think that would made it probably easier for Goldberg's family. I think they were just delighted that someone like that would take the time and have the class, as I mentioned, to ask for. And then afterwards, apparently, from what I've read, and you've probably read too, he's making a donation to the foundation that the Goldberg family set up in Marshall's memory at the University of Illinois in Chicago, which, again, is another gracious gesture, which impressed me as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's he's somebody that in the league – now, I'm not, there's so many players in the league that have the same type of mentality, but – He's in the forefront a lot, especially in his city, like you said, with the hurricane and some other things. And uh, it's hard not to like that kind of an individual and want to be on his side. And I, I wish him all the best over in 
Arizona's. Mm-hmm. I mean, they they have a good they have a good nucleus already. So we'll see what happens. He gets to go hang out with his boy New Hopkins. I don't know if you know much about <laughs> DeAndre Hopkins, the receiver. Yeah. Uh, one of the best on that side of the ball. Now JJ Watt historically was one of the best on the defensive side of the ball and We'll see what what goes down. Um, Speaking of one of the best, I'm going to give you a question that may be impossible to answer. But if you were to pick one player from Chicago Cardinal history, Arizona Cardinal history, St. Louis Cardinal history, and you would retire the jersey, who would it be? That would be Paddy Driscoll. He played uh, from the 20s to 25 with the Cardinals, then went over to the Bears, eventually became the head coach. But Problem is, they didn't wear jerseys back then, jersey numbers for a lot of the years. But I think he would be the one who really epitomizes the Cardinals. The other one, and I'm cheating here by giving you a second one, would be Charlie Trippi. Charlie changed the way the players were compensated in the NFL, and he broke all of Goldberg's offensive records. And uh, so I think that that would be my two choices anyway, if you're going to retire a jersey, those those two. One, who I'm not quite sure what his number would be, and Charlie Trippi, of course, did have a jersey number. It's hard with – I'm torn on the whole retiring jersey thing, especially in a sport like football where there's the – after they change it to you have to have a certain football number or a number for your position because then it really mm-hmm. takes away. I think – I want to say maybe it was the Bears that have the most – if they do, it would make sense because of the longevity of the team. Yeah, I think they have 14 retired numbers. Yeah, so at some point in time, it's, you know, you keep going and you're going to start saying, okay, these players that from the, after you decide to stop retiring jerseys, these 50 years, okay, this doesn't matter anymore compared to the before. And let's not get into all of that. I mean, the Cowboys, they make it a statement to not retire jerseys. But then right, yes. I saw where Aikman, so number eight, 22, I think, Staubach's number 12, maybe Bob Lilly, I think is 74. The other, I think those are the ones where like basically nobody's worn them since then. But for some reason, Michael Irvin, they say it's kind of off limits, but then they let five guys wear it <laughs> since the, I don't know. So there's, we all know the Cowboys are kind of crazy and stuff like that. And I seen Jackie Robinson's number was retired for the whole league. And I've mm-hmm. seen where Kobe Bryant's number eight and 24, not just by the Lakers, but then like even way across the Europe league, there was a basketball team in Greece Ooh. that they retired it. I saw the Miami heat retired Michael Jordan's number or something like that for no reason. So it's all these weird diff- different things that, you know, Jersey numbers. I did go back. Now I don't, I have not confirmed this, but I could, I could only find out a few websites. It seemed like the very first ever Jersey that was retired was, the guy's name was Ace Bailey for the Toronto Maple Leafs. On he he got hurt on a game December 12, nineteen thirty three. It was a brutal hit and then a fight and all these other things. And then he was essentially not paralyzed, I don't think, but from what I understand, never going to play again. And then about a month later, nineteen thirty four, January twenty fourth, the owner Con Smith he comes out and says to the it was it was uh, Ace Bailey Day at at the Toronto Maple Leafs, and he comes out and he says to the crowd. No other player on a Maple Leaf hockey team will ever wear the number six again or something like that. And that seems to be what I could find is the first professional sports team to retire a jersey, again, with limited digging into research and such. Yeah, I would I would not know who the first NFL person was. Again, it would take some digging. I tried to find that. I had a hard time. You mentioned 53 or whatever it was for, for uh, the Chicago Cardinals, and I it's, it's high. There's it, somebody has it out there. So if someone listening to this yeah. knows what it is, please contact Sports History Network and tell us what the very first ever NFL jersey. You want to know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'd like to have a list of like all the lists that I could find are the jersey numbers and the teams, but I couldn't find the dates for when they were retired or like oh, all no. of the reasonings. Like, unfortunately, like you mentioned, a lot of them have to do with tragedies, just like this one, the very first ever Toronto Maple Leafs in 1934, mm-hmm. and. I want to just know <laughs> when was the first one. Uh, so speaking of that, wanting to know, I'm going to give you, I am going to give you the virtual keys to the DeLorean like I do every Ooh. week. I'm going to let you go back to the 1947 championship game. You can relive it. You can take one other person with you. Who are you taking? Oh, man. I would love to be with a guy who was there at the time who was Chet Bulger. 
the lineman for the Cardinals, who is easily the most entertaining former player that I've ever had the chance to talk to. He's gone now, but uh, to get his insight when things were going kind of crazy on the field in that particular game, there was a frozen field and the clubhouse attendant for the Cardinals was bringing towels over to the Eagles and noticed they were filing down their spikes, making them razor sharp to get more traction. The Cardinals, on the other hand, had already decided they're going to wear gym shoes and get better traction, which they did. But the Cardinals coach, Jimmy Councilman, knew this. And I know we talked about this on a previous show, but waited until the Eagles had the ball and then pointed it out to the referee so that they could uh, get penalized, which did hurt the Eagles early. But I would love to see or hear what Chet Bulger had to say about that, how the Cardinals outsmarted perhaps the Eagles, at least on that very first play in that game. That would be really neat to have that type of insight. Oh yeah, that'd be cool to talk to the guys. I always ask the question to if I nowadays if I talk to a player, what would you what huddle would you like to go into like on the opposite? Oh, yeah. And it's all different people have different stories or interesting, you know, I wish I would have known that play because then I could have made, you know, the interception or whatever it was. And uh, the one guy I wanted to know about I'm, I'm it's blanking who it is, but he wanted to know what the other quarterback was thinking or something. And, you know, just all those kinds of things. And uh, speaking of, you just brought it up. Okay. A recent episode of when football was football talked about the 1947 championship game. So what's, what do we have on tap? Let's talk about a couple of the next topics that these listeners of the show can, can get from you. Well, there's some really fun stuff coming up. We always talk about the oldest rivalry in the NFL. And if every time the Bears and the Packers play and it's all over the TV, the NFL's oldest rivalry. And of course, I just go nuts because it was the Bears and the Cardinals. But I thought it'd be fun to go back and really dig down deep and show what about that first game between the Bears and the Packers? There's some hilarious stuff because you had virtually a very, very small town bringing about half the city to Chicago by train to play in this game. And so there's more to more to the story than just the game and how the people in Green Bay were just all oh, so excited to be able to play. And remember, they uh, got kicked out of the league early too, but got brought back in because Curly Lambeau was using some college players. So all those little side stories will be brought into that. So that's uh, something we look forward to doing. And then another one, be on the uh, remarkable career of Ali Matson. He went from a silver medalist in the Olympics uh, to being uh, all pro uh, for the Chicago Cardinals. And then, of course, traded for nine different players later on. So uh, it'll be a good one as well. well. There you go. Now, you might have heard that J.J. Watt had to ask Marshall Goldberg's family for the right to wear number 99 this upcoming season. But as Paul Harvey says... Now you know the rest of the story. I want to thank Josie Amba, a true, what we'll call MVP of the Football History Dude podcast, as it seems anytime we need some help with Chicago football history, he is the guy that we turn to. Every time I bring him on, I just sit back and I have to try to scoop up all these golden gridiron knowledge now I guess all over the floor because there's no way that I can keep him in my head the first go around. And again, if you enjoy Joe's work, you can read a full article of Marshall Goldberg's life over on the website. To get there, head to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash M Goldberg. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to the footballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. 
and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.